Welcome. I'm Robin Alders, a, a consulting fellow with the Chatham House Global Health Program, and uh, Chatham House is a partner organisation with the Poultry Hub. This is the 11th panel in our roadmap series, Discussions for the Future of Poultry, People and Planet. These fortnightly discussions address key issues for sustainable development from the perspective of nutrition security and the global poultry industry. We aim to contribute to the call from the United Nations that we build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic, the future we want. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get underway. Today's discussion uh, will last for one hour. The event is being recorded and will be available on the One Health Poultry Hub website and a direct link, a direct link will be sent to all registered attendees. Please put your questions to the panel through the Zoom Q&A function which you can access at the bottom of your screens. Feel free to vote for the questions that you think are particularly important. And if English is not your first language, please don't let this stop you. I'm uh, Australian and the British tell me that my English is not great, but we still manage to understand each other. I will put as many of your questions as possible to our panelists. If your question is covered in a previous answer, or if we run out of time, then please accept my apologies. We have an online discussion channel that you can access from the Hub website and from your registration link. So please do explore this option to share questions, comments and thoughts. These online discussions will contribute to a series of briefing notes that we'll be preparing from this series. Today's discussion is on food systems, climate change and animal source food. And it explores the question as to whether we can both nourish humanity and our domestic animals and still save the planet. First, we'd welcome your thoughts on this topic and we'll do this via a poll, which is hopefully going to pop up on your screens now. Um, as soon as you vote, the poll will disappear from your screen. And we're asking for your thoughts um, on the global food system as a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions driving climate change. How can our food systems achieve net zero by 2050. There are four options there. We'll leave you to enter your, um, your responses and we'll come back to that um, after the first presentation. I'm delighted to welcome our expert panelists for today. Firstly, we say a big thank you to Dr. Julia De Bruin, a senior fellow in food systems and nutrition at the Natural Resources Institute. She stepped in at short notice as Dr. Sylvia Kapagam from India is unable to join us today. And uh, welcome to Professor Mark Howden, Director of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University. And uh, Mark is also a Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, and the second working group. Each of you has 10 minutes to present your thoughts. We'll give you a signal at nine minutes and then you'll have one minute to wrap up. So with no further ado, over to you, Dr. Bruin. Hello everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, see my screen there. Um, Thanks for the introduction, Robin. It's really nice to have a chance to join today's panel. Um, my background around livestock um, and nutrition has been in the context of low and middle income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's kind of the framing in which I um, bring some reflections to the panel today. Um, so um, I'll start with a couple of concepts. Um, when we talk about animal source foods, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about quite a broad range of um, food items from domestic and non-domestic species, um, terrestrial and aquatic. Um, a term that also sometimes is used is livestock derived foods as a subset of the broader umbrella of animal source foods. But I think um, when we have discussions like the one today, it's important to recognize that we're talking about um, a wide range of food items um, and also a wide range of um, production systems that contribute these items. Um, terminology around sustainable and healthy diets, um, I think has risen in prominence in recent years. Um, if we think of years gone by, there was a much more of an emphasis on um, discussion around hunger and undernourishment. 
and this sort of transition within um, institutional reports and funding calls and academic literature to think about sustainable healthy diets is kind of a broader approach to the um, health and environmental impacts of um, food choice. Um, so from this report by the FAO and World Health Organization, we get a set of guiding principles around um, healthy, sustainable diets, which I won't go through in full, um, but just to draw out a few points that are highlighted in these guidelines. We see healthy, sustainable diets as being um, drawn from a diverse range of food groups, um, potential for healthy diets to include animal source foods, um, the importance of meeting requirements for growth, development, health and activity, whilst also um, maintaining within uh, environmental targets, preserving biodiversity and considering how accessible and desirable um, diets are. Um, in the context in which my work has been based, we think about these sort of many complex pathways between livestock and human health and nutrition. Um, some positive and some negative, but within today's session, we'll focus particularly on animal source food consumption rather than broader livestock nutrition linkages. So I guess a report that probably comes to mind when people think about animal source foods and healthy, sustainable diets is the Planetary Health uh, Report, the Eat Lancet Report from a couple of years ago. And here we've got a set of um, guidelines around recommended intake of different animal source foods. And we can see that these range from um, a vegan diet up to consumption of sort of one to two glasses of milk each day, uh, maybe two or three eggs per week, and small amounts of um, meat and seafood. So to just quickly reflect on some of the positive and negative um, aspects of animal source foods, um, I guess the benefits rest heavily on the fact that animal source foods present a um, nutrient dense form of nutrition. So the particular micronutrients will vary between food products, but we're talking about um, high content of multiple micronutrients in forms that the body can um, take up and process readily, um, high levels of protein, digestible protein that has an amino acid profile that's well matched to human requirements. I guess what's been more challenging has been having um, reliable, large scale evidence around nutritional impact of animal source food consumption. I'm sure many people on this call are familiar with various reports that have been written um, to try and collate evidence around uh, nutritional impact of animal source foods um, and some of the challenges that have been in place around um, data sources, um, intervention studies versus panel data and our ability to quantify the impact that might exist. Um, so a few potential positive impacts listed here. Some are more um, recognised than others, like the role of uh, dairy products in, in bone health and preventing fractures, um, the role of fish in cognitive performance and neurodevelopment, um, and perhaps also the role of milk in linear growth or height of children. On the flip side, um, the negative aspects of animal source foods often link to the saturated fat content um, and associations with certain types of cancer, um, coronary heart disease, uh, foodborne illness, um, as well as other potential negative impacts. Um, so it's no surprise that we see wide variation in the extent which animal source foods are consumed across different settings. Um, one challenge that we have in um, making comparisons in dietary um, contribution is we don't have very reliable large-scale dietary intake data. So here we rely on uh, food supply data. We can see some wide variation in meat supply um, between regions, but also within regions in some cases. Um, we also see this association between increasing GDP and increasing average meat supply. So to return to the Eat Lancet report and some of the recommendations that have been made, I guess I draw people's attention to the fact that um, within these infographics, we've got this circle marking the, the recommended intake of um, different food groups or food items. And we can see that at a global level, we've got um, substantial overconsumption of red meat and eggs um, and uh, high consumption of other animal source foods. If we take a regional 
um, approach and consider the levels of consumption within sub-Saharan Africa, we see that there's scope to increase consumption of most animal source foods and still remain within that, um, that guideline of the reference diet. Another key point to um, highlight is the inequalities in nutritional status, food access, including animal source food access um, at different levels. So I guess we're aware of differences between the global north and the global south. Um, we also see substantial differences existing uh, within regions, within countries, and often within households as well. So I'll just finish by um, referencing a, a couple of papers that I think lend some interesting insights to this topic. Um, both of them highlight the, the huge variation in environmental impact of different livestock production systems and different food products. Um, this paper kind of highlights the, the fact that um, often the experience of women and children, nutritionally vulnerable populations, is, is overlooked or um, given inadequate attention with the um, high focus on environmental impact of animal source foods um, and the need to take an equity approach in, in um, approaching that uh, disparity. Um, and the other paper presents a life cycle analysis of different uh, animal products and different production systems and demonstrates some really wide variation in uh, different forms of environmental impact between products. So um, I'll finish there, but look forward to continuing um, to discuss these issues in, in our question time and our discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. De Bruyne. That was really fabulous. And you've certainly pr provided considerable food for thought regarding linkages between animal source food and sustainable human diets. Your presentation is starting to generate some questions. I'd like to make time to ask you one question that's come in from Lara Holman. She's asking, it seems that evidence of nutritional impact of animal source food is scarce. Do we have enough information to justify promoting animal source foods given the known environmental impacts of livestock production systems? So if you could take a couple of minutes to respond to that and then we'll go on to, to, to Professor Howden. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's it's definitely a topic that continues to um, receive a lot a lot of scrutiny, a lot of attention. Um, the the extent to which we have adequate evidence to be continuing to promote livestock derived foods or animal source foods. Um, I think it's important to to think about the the types of data that we have available and the kinds of conclusions we can draw from different types of data. So we can gain certain insights from looking at observational studies, you know, large panel data. Um, other, other insights can be drawn from randomised controlled trials. So I guess we're sort of faced with, with data gaps that are probably going to be ongoing. Um, but we're also seeing interesting findings emerge, including a paper just from, um, I think, a week or so ago, which looked at some different temporal dimensions to these kind of analyses. So um, this particular paper highlighted that when we think about um, and was shown that analysis that looked at animal source food consumption over a previous 12 month period had a much closer association with reducing child stunting than if we just took a, a kind of a cross-sectional look at animal source food consumption and nutritional status. So thinking about some of the kind of temporality of um, analyses can be really useful. And I guess the other sort of data that lends a lot of strength to recommendations is um, kind of linear programming or performing modeling to understand available food resources, look at nutrient gaps in diets and be able to formulate recommendations um, according to a, a given setting and given opportunities. Thanks, Julia, that was a, a great response. Before we go on, could we have the results of the first poll? Um, I think we've got some interesting results coming in. And uh, it's about a third of us think that we really do need to reduce consumption of animal source food at a global level. 65% of us um, uh, think that both options one and two, which is reducing global consumption of animal source food and increasing the efficiency of food production through nature-based agriculture is important. So that's a very interesting combination. Thanks so much for your
for your views on that. I'm now very pleased to, to hand over to Professor Mark Howden for your talk. Thank you. Um, th thanks very much, Robin. And uh, um, good evening or good morning, uh, depending on where you are. Um, so hopefully we've got a full screen up there. Yep. Okay. Um, so today I'm just going to give a very quick run through on climate change and animal sourced food, and particularly focusing on livestock, um, a la that um, picture there where we need to stop going round and round in, in infinite loops <clears throat> on this topic and actually move ahead. Now, as we've heard from Julia, is that um, livestock are crucial nutritionally for many people, but they also have significant economic and other values um, which we need to recognise. And that's particularly important because there's areas of the world which there are no alternative productive uses of land um, than livestock-based um, uses. And, but when we look at livestock systems across the globe, um, what we actually have is, is a, a, a really significant challenge. Um, uh, we actually have significant competition for land, and that's because there's um, cropping uses, um, usage of land for cities, uh, usage of land now for energy with solar PV, um, usage of land for carbon sequestration, um, water resource management and biodiversity and other things. So the area for livestock system is being squeezed. We also have often a very degraded resource base. So our soils aren't in great condition in many cases. We've also got genetic simplification of our genetic bases right across many livestock species and accumulating disease issues as we've seen particularly coming out of East Asia. Um, we've seen consumer preferences change, uh, which have been driving um, uh, producers in different ways, price pressures, so cost price squeezes, and trade issues emerging, including trade barriers. And the thing that I'm going to focus on particularly now is climate change. And as we all know, um, the climate is changing. It's driven by human greenhouse gas emissions. We collectively produce about 50 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents per year, and that keeps on going up and up until we hit COVID where it took a, probably a temporary dive. If we look at the component of livestock um, that is actually um, contributing to that, um, agriculture and food responsible for almost a third of our greenhouse gas emissions, which are driving the climate changes we're seeing. Um, and livestock itself in, in total is around about 22% of that. Um, so it's far too big to ignore. If we look particularly at subsectors like that, poultry, it's probably around about 1.2%, so much smaller. So the big ones in terms of livestock uh, are the um, cattle, dairy cattle and beef cattle, and also sheep and, and similar animals. And it's not just that they affect the climate at a global scale, but they also affect localised land use change too. So they check, change the um, water relationships and temperatures at a local scale. When we look at our options to reduce that imprint of livestock on climate change, we actually have few immediate technical options to use, particularly to reduce methane. There are some, such as feed additives or increased oils in the diet, which reduce emissions, methane emissions, by around about 10 to 30%, but mostly that's relevant only to intensive livestock systems, not the extensive ones. And in those systems, really the only options we have potentially are vaccines, so you give a once in a lifetime jab, but that's still a long way off. We've been looking at that for over 20 years now. Improved management and husbandry of animals is actually really the best way forward in the immediate term. And that gen generally increases the efficiencies in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So we produce less greenhouse gases per unit livestock products that come off our land. And we all can also change that in, a way, in ways that increase the carbon sequestration, the carbon content of our landscapes. Sometimes that's in conflict with production and sometimes not. It depends on how you do it and where you do it. But if we do this well, what we see is those improvements in management which push towards efficiencies in greenhouse gas emission and increased carbon sequestration are also very often aligned with sustainable and ethical management. A very different way from the supply side focus of what I talked about previously was the demand side strategies. So for, for starters, we can reduce loss and waste. One example is offal is often wasted in developed countries, um, and yet that's a potentially a significant resource. We also have wasted food. Um, so food that's in the refrigerator, which goes off, or in other situations, which is heat affected um, and unable to be used. 
We also can reduce the consumption, and uh, Julia mentioned this briefly, and that can have many different effects. Um, again, sort of fitting in with that planetary boundary idea. So reduced consumption can reduce environmental concerns broadly. So we reduce our footprint on, on land systems. It can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but that's very dependent on the product we are focusing on. So for example, beef per serve produces around about six times more emissions than chicken per serve. And that's about 15 times more than if eggs per serve, which is, um, and then if we go to a vegetarian diet, it's, it's less again. So greenhouse gas emissions are very sensitive to dietary choices. Um, obviously, reducing our consumption can contribute to animal rights issues, contribute to human health issues. So reduced meat consumption in diet reduces um, three of the big uh, killers in, in West Western worlds. So that includes cancer and coronary heart disease. And also there's a price element. Often eating vegetarian is cheaper than eating meat-based diets. You just have to be careful about the nutrition aspects. And increasingly, in terms of that demand side for livestock products, we start to see alternative products such as Impossible Burger and Perfect Day Milk, which reportedly have much lower environmental footprints than livestock equivalent livestock products do. But we really need to know that those products often come at a price and also only in some places, so they're not universally available. If we look forward now at climate change, um, what we see is a future where increased heat will be a significant contributor to livestock issues and livestock health and production. Um, this is because if you've got a highly productive animal, it generates a huge amount of metabolic heat. That animal has to get rid of that heat in some way. And in a hot and humid environment, it's very difficult to do that. So the automatic response of animals is to reduce their intake because that reduces the metabolic heat load and actually maintains homeostasis. We also have increasing prospects of drought in many places. If we look at heat as a, as a figure and then at drought, so if we look in this particular example, we've got deadly heat stress days historically um, occur you know, up to about 100 days a year um, in various parts of the world. If we look at the bottom right-hand panel, this is the future heat stress days under a high emissions scenario towards the end of the century. And you can see that right across big parts of the world, the equatorial regions, that almost every day becomes a heat stress day. That will impact on humans producing food and also impact on animals. And so the prospects for heat and climate change are extreme. If we look at um, drought, is that this is a very recent study and which indicates that uh, under future change, um, that significant areas of the world, um, including North Africa, parts of Southern Africa, Australia, the Mediterranean, parts of Central Asia, parts of the Americans, Americas are likely to get seriously in big increases in drought frequency, but other parts may have less. With this change in drought frequency and extreme events, food prices are likely to go up. Food trade is likely to go up because we have to shift food around to compensate for these um, situations. And there will be an increasing competitive advantage of those who adapt best. If we look at other factors um, in terms of climate change, more challenges in terms of water availability, roughly across those um, subtropical regions, more climate variability and more climate extremes, which increase risk of production. And that in that way, drive down inputs and drive down productivity. If we look at the future of climate change, that's overall negative in developing countries, but some possible benefits in colder environments. And importantly, Climate changes are already impacting on agricultural productivity around the globe. So this is a study that only came out a couple of weeks ago, which was based on a, an earlier Australian um, study, which showed that climate changes that have happened already have drive, driven down agricultural productivity by around about 21%. So this isn't about the future. This is what's happened already in terms of agricultural productivity. And you can see again, those impacts are greatest in the developing world um, and less so in the developed world. And so the average production driven down is already 21%. So think about how many people that could already in, um, impact on and already feed. So climate change is here already and it's going to be increasingly so in the future. And we need to be much more systematic in how we treat that in terms 
of dealing with climate change in amongst all of the other issues that we have to deal with. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark. A really challenging situation. Um, there are plenty of questions coming in. We're going to keep you both very busy. I'd like to just use my privilege here as moderator to ask you one question. Uh, so to you, Mark, how can we both meet the nutritional needs that livestock, um, uh, that livestock support currently, as well as meet the need to go to net zero greenhouse gas emissions? by 2050 or preferably sooner? Well, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And, and in many ways, I, we, we classify agriculture as one of the hard to abate sectors. You know, it's hard to reduce those emissions down to zero um, simply because we haven't got the technologies to reduce things like greenhouse gas and methane from livestock, ruminant livestock and nitrous oxide from crops in a cost effective way. Um, and so, so that means I think at least for the foreseeable future, we will have a significant greenhouse gas footprint from food systems and animal food systems particularly, uh, which is going to have to be offset by other ways. Um, but within that envelope, I think we can do um, significant reductions in uh, emissions and at the same time um, deliver nutritional uh, benefits. So for example, if we look at improving management and husbandry of animals, um, we can significantly reduce almost half um, the amount of greenhouse gases per unit product that we generate from many systems. So going from a relatively poor management to moderate management or moderate to good, we can effectively halve the greenhouse gas emissions per unit product. So improving management right across the globe um, is not only often uh, going to reduce the greenhouse footprint to feed a certain number of people, but it's often more profitable um, and it often is much more sustainable. So we have more sustainable systems. So we need to develop that as a best practice, which propagates right across the globe. Oh, we sorry, can't hear you, Rob. I'm now unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Um, we've got plenty of questions coming in. People, please vote because we've got so many questions, we may not get through all of them in the coming 25 minutes. So use that voting option. I, um, I now have one uh, question from Mary uh, Cup. Kaparungi, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Um, Mary is asking what should be done to increase animal source food consumption in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, possibly Julia uh, and then Mark, if you'd like to also answer. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question, Mary. Um, it's obviously a key point when we see those sorts of um, figures that show such a, a wide variation and when we know the nutrient gaps that exist in, in many diets in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I guess it, um, we've got opportunities to increase um, consumption through sort of supply considerations and also demand side factors. Um, so the sorts of contexts in which I have worked have been with smallholder farmers, um, particularly chicken keepers, of relevance to this hub, um, and the kind of constraints that um, present real barriers in those uh, conditions is that um, productivity of chickens is low, and also the, the sort of constraints that are faced in terms of livestock mortality in, in rural smallholder households is a, is a very real barrier to people consuming animal source foods. So I guess that's um, sort of one potential uh, kind of breadth of interventions that can be um, uh, approached. So finding ways to deliver veterinary services effectively and increase um, management uh, interventions that um, maintain animal health, productivity, and make animal source foods more available to um, households that are likely to have um, quite uh, prominent nutrient gaps within their diets. I don't know, Mark, if you wanted to speak. As well to that. Well, look, uh, I, I agree with all, all of what Julia said. I, I think um, there's a couple of other things which we can think about too. And, uh, and, and one of those is uh, looking to, where possible, um, bring in shrubs and trees, particularly leguminous shrubs, shrubs and trees into those areas. Um, so they can actually be a part of a cut and carry um, feed system, which can support animals, um, particularly during you know, dry seasons and, and during dry times, you've got a, an extended length of feeding that you can access from that. And at the same time, of course, that um, tends to 
increase the carbon content on landscapes. So it's a, a small contribution, but an important contribution uh, to reducing the, the climate change impacts themselves, uh, as well as having localized benefits in terms of microclimate. So, so I think uh, some, some agencies have, have been uh, developing those ideas very actively with people who work in sub-Saharan Africa and live and, and farm in sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, Mark. Um, we have a question for you uh, from Ruth Zadox, uh, voted up. Uh, and uh, Ruth is asking, how accurate is the estimate of 22% of greenhouse gas emissions originating from ruminants? Does it account for carbon sequestration in the plants that ruminants consume? and that couldn't be used for human nutrition without conversion by ruminants? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Ruth. It's a really good question. And you always have to sort of, when dealing with inventories, you have to put boundaries around things one way or the other. So that that 22% or, or thereabouts um, has, has about plus or minus 6% um, uh, variation, as in like it could be 6% um, lower or 6% higher. Um, the, that variation happens because there are different ways of calculating that. Um, there's different ways of estimating impact in intake of animals and also of the conversion factors of methane. So there's, there's a range of variables there. Um, but also that does tend to in include uh, essentially value chain emissions. So for example, if we look at um, poultry systems, significant parts of the emissions budget in delivering a, a serve of, of chicken meat or of eggs um, comes from energy production. So um, for heating or cooling uh, chicken sheds or in terms of vehicle um, usage um, and, and similar things. And so uh, those that 22% includes those components um, as well as land use change components. So in land use change, some of that's negative where you clear land, um, some of it's positive where you reforest or, or reestablish um, agroforestry and lands. Uh, so those are usually best estimates um, taken, including all of those factors. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we have, have another high voting question here. I think this one is um, for Julia. Melanie Hay is asking, given how consumption varies so greatly across different regions and socioeconomic groups, how can strategies be put in place to enable increased animal source food consumption by some people or in some settings while avoiding overconsumption elsewhere. Thanks, yeah, I think that's really um, at the forefront of many people's minds as we see these sort of transitioning food systems, transitioning diets, um, shifting kind of nutritional priorities and challenges um, with kind of urbanization and income growth within uh, the global south. So um, I guess it, it is going to be a complex issue. Um, I think it sort of come back, come, can it be helpful to come back to thinking about the sort of drivers of food choice and drivers of food consumption. So th thinking through um, some of the kind of frameworks that have risen in prominence around sort of food environments and food systems. We think about issues around um, physical access to animal source foods, economic access, desirability, prices, and thinking about the ways in which we can sort of address some of those to increase consumption where, where those factors are constraining access, whilst also, I guess, maintaining a focus on, on this concept of healthy, sustainable diets. Um, and I guess that's a framing that um, avoids being very prescriptive about um, the extent to which animal source foods could, should be consumed um, and sort of steps back to sort of uh, acknowledge that diets and dietary recommendations do vary between contexts, between population groups, um, according to available food resources. And so if we can sort of maintain messaging around the importance of healthy, balanced diets, while also addressing strategies that inhibit that through constraints to access, um, I think we can you know, find a, a, a way forward that that increases dietary adequacy while avoiding that sort of shift towards overconsumption and um, particularly excessive intake of, of animal source foods. Thanks, Julia. We have fabulous questions coming in. There are a couple of questions um, mentioning we haven't really uh, included animal welfare in this discussion today. We do recognize the importance of animal welfare and, and in fact, it was so important that we have already had a panel session 
looking at when animal welfare issues. So I would, if you haven't seen that recording, I would encourage you to get there. We will try to get to all of your questions. Um, and I am, on some occasions, I am going to try and also get some geographical spread. So if, uh, uh, I'll follow most of the voting, but I might jump to some uh, people from, from uh, various parts of the world as well. Next question for you, Mark, that's coming in from Kate Wingert. What are the greenhouse gas emission intensities of beef, chicken, and eggs when nutrient profile is the functional unit compared with weight as the functional unit? Ooh, um, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, certainly, uh, the, the sort of the, the basic element there is, is when, when we look at per serve and, uh, and when you know, so that, that, that particular study that I drew those numbers from, um, and usually that takes into account nutritional requirements. And so, so my assumption is when, when those, you know, six times factor between, you know, meat from beef and, and meat from chickens um, includes, uh, you know, a nutritionally adequate serve. So, so I suspect they're somewhat similar, um, but maybe not exactly according to those proportions. Julia might have some more specific knowledge there. I'm sorry, I can't really <laughs> lend too much to that one. Yeah. Okay, well, in that case, um, I'd like to go on. Uh, the next highest uh, question here is from uh, Justine Pierce, who asked, when you refer to the management, when you refer to management, if you're referring to intensification, given the negative welfare impacts associated with these systems, do you think most of our attention should be on reducing food waste and better distribution of food across the globe to reduce food loss and waste and overconsumption. Um, I'm not sure whether one or both of you would like to tackle that. I guess the issue of food waste is um, particularly pertinent when we're talking about animal source foods as a kind of perishable food item. And particularly when we think about settings in which um, opportunities for cold chains and um, sort of preservation through refrigeration is um, is not available. So um, I think yeah, issues around food food loss and waste, um, whether that be sort of um, losses that occur within production systems, including related to animal health and um, management practices, or the kind of post post harvest losses that exist um, sort of along the supply chain and through to, to consumer level. Um, obviously we see differences as, as in food loss and waste more broadly where we have um, a higher concentration of loss existing at consumer level in high income nations and uh, sort of higher um, pre-harvest or um, production level losses within low income settings. Um, but definitely agree that when we talk about sort of improving efficiency within supply chains and um, you know, avoiding unnecessary losses, unnecessary emissions, as Mark's kind of spoken about, um, thinking about the efficiency and the losses um, is obviously very crucial. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll did, pitch did in. Did you just, want to add anything, Mark? Yeah, just just briefly on the on the management intensification side of things. I mean, that's a that's a still a very active debate within the. Um, both the, the research community, but also within farming communities. And, and one of the really important things there is, is actually to be very clear about what is trying to be achieved. Um, and so sometimes it's about dollars and sometimes it's about, you know, someone has a different set of values and it's more about sustainability. Sometimes it's about animal welfare. And so, so there can be many different metrics which then determine to some extent what is a, an acceptable intensification or um, extensification agenda. Uh, I think one comment that it's fair to say is that as you go down an intensification route, um, almost always capital expenditure increases um, and almost always risk increases um, if you think broadly about risk. And, and in many circumstances, uh, farmers are capital limited and they're also quite risk averse. And so um, there just needs to be a lot of care taken um, when you're dealing with, with farmers who are in vulnerable situations um, that you don't increase their vulnerability by pushing them towards um, intensification. And so, so our advice always has to be very context appropriate, I think. Thanks, Mark. We have a great uh, question here from Professor Nitish in Bangladesh. 
He's asking, should we not focus more on poultry production as an alternative with lower emissions and that can also fulfill nutritional demands? I, th Julia, I think Mark, who'd like to start? I'll, I'll give a quick, quick call. Look, I, I, th I think that in, in many ways that's already happening. So, so in many uh, developed countries, um, we also already see that um, transition from red meat to white meats. Um, and, and, and so there's a you know, good environmental outcomes that have arise from that in many circumstances. Um, but also it's led to uh, you know, animal in, industrial farming, um, which, which has a whole range of, of implications as well, uh, particularly in terms of animal welfare and, and concentration of pollutants and similar things. Um, uh, look, I, I think... Um, that, that trend will continue um, and it will continue in ways which move outside of the livestock domain. So, so if you think about, um, you know, having a, an animal which converts, say, a grain base um, into a, a meat product or a dairy product, um, at some stage we'll think about how do we move away from using the animal as that intermediary actor. And so, so that will be when we move into the... Um, you know, the impossible burger type domains much more strongly than that we currently do. But having said that, there will always be parts of the world um, where that is not a viable proposition. And, and we need to be accepting. Um, I think that there are good arguments why livestock will be continuing to be part of uh, systems in, in many places for quite a long time ahead of us. Thanks, Mark. Julia, did you want to add on? Yeah, I guess just to agree the um, the importance of thinking about context in which um, one livestock species might be sort of favourable over another. I guess from a nutritional standpoint, there's um, lots of reasons to um, encourage, um, I guess, intake of eggs and, and poultry meat. Um, and, and I guess when we look at sort of current um, current intake across most settings, the sort of scope to, to meet nutrient requirements through changes in animal source food consumption Sort of generally sort of favouring an increase in, in consumption of white meat, seafood, of eggs, and decrease in, in red meat consumption. Thanks, uh, Julia. We, we have um, an interesting question here from Prakash Karinga, who's asking, how important is it to understand the reciprocal nature of the intersection of climate change and food systems as one affects the other? I'll, I'll, I'll have a crack at that. Um, uh, so, so Julia actually mentioned, um, in, a, in a sense, that, that work which has been done, which which tries to to link um, different factors, you know, human health, obesity, you know, overnutrition and undernutrition, uh, um, you know, profit motives, um, climate change, broader environmental concerns, and so um, the sort of plant, planetary boundaries is one way of sort of expressing that, and. And, and so I don't think, in a sense, it's not it's not part of a reciprocal thing. It's actually more integrated than that. So um, so I, th I think what we can do is one when we start to think about that as a whole of system and perhaps a whole of value chain, um, uh, or um, looking at functional requirements. Uh, so this is a point Julia made before. It's it's not so much whether what where it's sourced from, but what it does for you in nutritional terms. And, and so starting to think about, um, you know, the, the ultimate purposes and the values associated with those purposes, I think, is a way of starting to move through some of these, what otherwise can be seen as trade-offs. You know, you can do this, but you lose on that sort of thing. And, and I think there are ways through that. I, um, if it's okay, Julia, I might, if you don't answer, we've just got so many questions that I'd love to give for as many people as possible. Jane Gibbons has asked a really... A um, uh, fascinating question here saying, does the estimate of chickens producing 5th time, 15 times less greenhouse gas than beef account for soya consumption, destroying rainforests and so loss of their climate mitigation effect? Um, it, some studies have been done which look at uh, um, differentiating between uh, um, uh, different types of chicken production in different systems. And so, so for a lot of the uh, um, 
you know, chickens grown immense many parts of the world, they never see a soybean. And so they, they're never implicated in that uh, sort of rainforest destruction. Whereas other chickens, say, say in industrial uh, systems, uh, you know, have high degrees of soybean. Um, but that will vary depending on whether they're um, chickens uh, producing meat or, or chickens producing eggs. So you have very different um, dietary requirements in, in those circumstances. And so, so again, my understanding is um, those chickens producing meat have a much higher intake in terms of soy than those producing eggs. So there's quite a different footprint, environmental footprint, on those different production systems. And, and of course, um, as demand increases, if we're going to produce, um, satisfy that demand in the same way using livestock, is that there are those risks of environmental degradation, including cutting down rainforests. Thanks. I'm about to skip several really important questions. I'm sorry, but I, I did want to, to put uh, one question to, the, to both of you uh, before we finish. And it comes from uh, Woodlands Community uh, Shanda. I, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, who asks, it seems that little consideration has been given here to the animal welfare issues at the core of this matter. Producing animal source food in the most carbon water friendly way requires use of intensely uneth unethical in terms of animal welfare factory farming. And to do it in a way which is more considerate to the animals involved is much less water carbon friendly. How would you respond to the position that from this information, the only reasonable route for us personally and globally is to pursue an entirely plant-based diet given that it is proven to be nutritionally adequate for humans during all stages of life, including infancy and pregnancy. Julia, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and I appreciate bringing the, um, the topic of animal welfare to the forefront in a discussion like this. Um, sometimes we sort of um, perhaps don't give a uh, relevant acknowledgement to the, the extent to which animal welfare varies so substantially between different production systems and, and different settings. Um, I guess the, the issue of uh, the opportunity to achieve a nutritionally adequate diet without inclusion of animal source foods um, is very contextually variable, as I think has been a, a kind of a common <laughs> point raised through many of the um, aspects of my discussion today. So I think um, for, for people in certain contexts that have access to a broad range of plant source foods, uh, sort of legumes, potentially supplements where nutrient gaps might exist, um, I think in those circumstances, there might be no problem in consuming an entirely plant-based ba diet. But when we think about um, diets in other parts of, of the world or people in, in certain circumstances where that breadth of nutritious food access is, is limiting, um, I think it's important to, to appreciate that there is a role for small amounts of animal source food to, to really substantially increase um, nutrient intake for vulnerable populations, including the groups you highlight, um, like a pregnant, um, lactating women, young children, I think where we've got these sort of really high nutrient requirements alongside constrained access to um, plant-based foods that will be able to meet those, I think we sort of need to be, you know, keeping an open mind about which is the best diet within a given setting. Um, and I guess it's yeah, obviously a very contentious topic. Uh, we've seen um, some strong statements coming out by different um, groups. Um, interestingly, a few years ago, the... Um, it's the German Dietitians Association put forward a statement saying that um, as a kind of professional body, they, they were not advocating a vegan diet for certain groups within the population, including during pregnancy and um, for young children. Um, so maybe I can throw to Mark to sort of speak more to the kind of welfare implications and different production systems. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. It's a great, great uh, sort of... Um, springboard to, to make a few other comments. Um, firstly, I'd actually suggest that um, welfare of animals is a different dimension um, from either environmental sustainability or production. So you can have, you know, well looked after animals um, that in, a, in an environmentally unfriendly situation or in an unprofitable situation, vice versa, all possible combinations. Um, so so I would actually argue instead that if you actually have uh, animals which are well looked after, they are more productive. 
So, so if you have animals, if it's hot, if you give them shade and water and they don't have to walk far for that, um, they're going to have more energy to actually be productive. If you actually give them plenty of food, you don't um, harshly treat your pastures so they can easily get an adequate diet themselves, um, they actually have to use less energy themselves. So they're happy cows or, or sheep or, or chickens um, and, uh, and they're also productive. So, so I think the question here is not about trying to set up a, um, a trade-off environment. It's actually saying, what are the systems that can give us those three different things? Um, you know, profitable and sustainable systems, good environmental outcomes and good animal health and welfare outcomes. And I think, as I said before, we can do that. Um, the challenge is, is that, as Julia said, it's very contextual. So, so we can't easily um, translate animals from place to place. So we can't take um, our standard chickens and expect them to um, live in central, central Australia and still be productive. You know, that's environments which beef cattle or sheep can still be productive, but not other types of livestock. And so if we did that for those chickens, that, that would be a, a welfare issue for those animals. That, that would not be a very friendly thing to do to them. Um, it's about matching up the right type of animal, the right type of management, the right type of um, ethics behind that management. And I think we can actually do that. So, so for me, um, it's not about all going plant-based for the reasons that Julia said. It's about having um, appropriate targets and those those goals are nutritional ones they're not type of food you know animal sourced versus plant-based source and then thinking about how we can best produce that and deliver that in the circumstances that people live thanks so much and and thanks for all of your questions we're we're um coming up to the to the end of our hour i think we have time for only one more question and uh, ruth mm, alafia tayo whose name I am sure I have not pronounced correctly, so apologies. But Ruth is asking, saying swine production and agriculture are becoming more popular in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, these two species have little or no effect on climate change. So is the FAO looking at increasing this awareness and putting mechanisms in place to change the shift towards these two species? I perhaps can't speak to um, FAO um, kind of policy or approaches, but I, I think it's important to yeah, bring these ideas to the table, particularly um, aquaculture and, and also capture fisheries within sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing a, um, you know, a, a rise in the um, attention given by researchers and, and policy and kind of investment um, around um, fish as a kind of important opportunity to enhance nutrient intake. Um, I guess there's additional environmental considerations at play around um, sort of fish stocks and um, other environmental implications of aquaculture production systems. Um, but I think there is, as you say, sort of a, a move towards acknowledging the kind of breadth of, of livestock species and um, production systems and, and kind of shifting back from perhaps a, um, a narrow focus on what livestock derived foods involve. Yeah, and, and like Julia, I can't comment on FAO <clears throat> policy, but, but if you think about, uh, say, aquaculture systems, they almost close the loop on nutrients. If they're run well, there's almost no nutrient loss from those systems. And so they don't outgas nitrogen, they don't um, outgas methane, um, which, which are actually losses to the systems that if we're running ruminant livestock. So, so they're, in a sense, much more efficient if they're well run. Um, and likewise, uh, um, swine production um, or pig production in uh, developing developed world context is, is a significant greenhouse gas emitter, largely because of the manure. But if you actually put that into a developing world context where that manure is, is incredibly value, again, you can effectively close that loop. So you have very little loss of greenhouse gases from that system. Uh, and so you're actually maintaining that, that, those nutrients within the system and building up productivity. So for those reasons, um, they, they actually have a, a really significant place where they can be run as long as you don't get things like disease build up and, uh, and you know, uh, maybe other environmental issues that can arise, you know, such as eutrophication if, if the system gets too big in, in some places. 
Thanks so much, Mark and Julia. This has been a wonderful discussion. It's a really important topic and one that we all do need to think about uh, very carefully. But uh, we are approaching the end of our live session. I'd like you to join with me in thanking our two expert panelists who have highlighted several crucial points for us to consider. Um, Julia highlighted the role of animal source foods in sustainable, healthy diets and mentioned that it varies substantially, this role varies substantially across the world. Types of evidence that can contribute to an improved understanding of the nutritional impact of animal source food um, uh, also uh, vary. Uh, the third point from Julia was that animal source foods prevent, present a vital opportunity to improve nutrient intake of nutritionally vulnerable groups in resource poor settings and must be balanced with efforts to promote healthy diets while also avoiding overconsumption. Mark's three key points were that the links between livestock and climate change are important and complex. Livestock are likely to be an ongoing component of food and nutrition security. Therefore, we must find ways to reduce its footprint and to adapt to accelerating climate change. The third point and very important one is that action is needed, but is currently not well supported by options. Importantly, there is an alignment between animal health, human health, and action on climate change and environmental stewardship. For you in our audience, we'd like to hear your perspectives following today's discussion. So in this final poll, um, please answer what you think following this discussion. You have four options there. So over to you for your um, vote uh, and how you're feeling after today's discussion. Once again, I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists, Dr. Julia De Bruyne and Professor Mark Howden. To our tech team working in the background to make everything run like clockwork, and to you, our audience, for your interest and thoughtful questions. Um, participants, when you have time, do please continue these discussions uh, via our online channel uh, using the link that you received at registration, or you can access it via the Hub website today, tomorrow, whenever you have time, preferably before the end of the series in, in August, so that we can capture that in our briefings. Um, the, Next event uh, coming up in our series will be held on Wednesday, the 12th of May. Please join us for a discussion with Christine Middlemas, the UK Chief Veterinary Officer, and Dr. Mark Schiff, the Australian Chief Veterinary Officer, and they'll be looking at One Health Biosecurity Governance. And the moderator, Professor Fiona Tomley, is going to ask them, can good biosecurity contribute to better health and a better economy? If we could now have a look at those poll results that are coming through there, and we want to see what you think after today's effort. Really interesting that uh, the greater majority, almost 90% of you uh, really feel that public health nutritionists, food producers, climate change specialists, and consumers need to work together to efficiently nourish communities using climate friendly, locally appropriate production systems. However, there are still some other people who, who have other thoughts. The most important thing is that this is a problem that affects all of us. And it's a problem that together we all have to solve. So thanks very much to you all. And do please stay safe. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for attending. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks time. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>